Hi everybody, thanks for uh, joining us in today. I am Eric here, the Chief Business Development for Incorp, uh, Officer for Incorp Group, one of the speakers of the day as well. And, and over here in the webcam, I, you can see Sarah Menon, uh, Managing Director of Orisa International. So before we start, if you're facing uh, audio issues, right, uh, you can go to the web tool that you can see on the right hand side of the screen. Go to click on the audio tab uh, and click on no audio first and then back to computer audio and this should solve the issue if you are facing an issue. So without further ado, uh, today marks the start of our regional webinar series co-organized by Incorp Group, a pan-Asia corporate services provider with presence in six countries in Asia, Orisa International, Southeast Asia focused uh, market research firm uh, with presence in six uh, Southeast Asian countries. This webinar series is also supported by our partners, uh, like, uh, including uh, Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce uh, and Industry, uh, Action Committee for Entrepreneurship, and many of our other network partners uh, in the region. This webinar series will be running uh, from today, June 2nd to the 11th, uh, covering key Asian markets, which includes India, Philippines, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and Singapore. So, uh, today's session, essentially, we will cover a, a very macro overview uh, topic on uh, planning for the future. How are we, how are companies going to explore business strategies and uh, new markets uh, in this current uh, situation? Uh, we hope to, or we will cover uh, case today, case studies illustrating how companies can improve their existing sales strategies for the Asia region. We aim to educate business owners on what are the key considerations that you will face or you should consider when you look to expand your businesses overseas, which can include legal uh, setting up, uh, regulations, taxation, and uh, I would say uh, more importantly, comparisons between the key Asian markets uh, in the markets that I spoken about earlier on. So tomorrow uh, onwards uh, to 11 June, like I say, we will also have country specific sessions that covers uh, the various countries of which you can join in for free with the same login and registration uh, that you have signed up uh, for today. So yes, uh, today I'm one of the speakers uh, again, and uh, Seraph here, as you can see uh, in the webcam, uh, I don't know, Seraph, is your webcam on? Uh, the format of today's session will also start off with Seraph um, presenting on sales strategy in Southeast Asia, and then I will take on as a spe second speaker of which I will cover revenue diversification strategies and uh, which will cover the key considerations to expanding regionally uh, into Asia. So at the end of our session today, which will take approximately 45 minutes or so, we will open up the floor uh, for a 10-minute Q&A session from the participants. Uh, at any time, if you wish to pose a question, right, you can make use of this webinar tool. Uh, you can see the questions tab uh, in the tool, and you can key in your questions uh, anytime during the presentation. Uh, our staff will also start collating uh, some of the questions uh, that uh, you have uh, indicated inside, and then we will discuss on during on uh, during the live uh, Q and A session. So, without further ado, uh, Sarah, I will pass on the mic uh, to you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Eric. Um, let me um, just uh, launch my slides. Um, all righty, okay. I think that should be coming up. I think for the purposes of the presentation, let me just switch on my webcam. Um, can you see the um, slides? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, yep. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, once again, uh, uh, thank you everybody for joining us uh, this uh, afternoon for um, uh, for this uh, webinar. And I also want to thank uh, Eric for inviting me to join him today to discuss this uh, topic. Um, my name is uh, Saraf Menon and I am the Managing Director of Arisa International, which is headquartered here in Singapore. And uh, today, my, my webinar will basically revolve around case studies of projects we have done uh, for some companies who have engaged us for various um, export strategy projects uh, in Southeast Asia. And my purpose in presenting these case studies is basically to illustrate uh, perhaps some mistakes or some things that companies may want to be thinking about but, but they may not be aware of and examples of what other companies may be doing to improve um, their sales strategy in uh, the region. 
My hope is that by sharing these examples, this may benefit your own company uh, as you review your own uh, sales strategies for Southeast Asia. Um, I have made these case studies um, uh, anonymous um, uh, in the interest of client confidentiality, but they involve a mix of both multinational companies as well as local companies here in, uh, in Singapore and also in the region. And uh, once my presentation is over, I will uh, pass this uh, over to Eric for his segment of the presentation, and I'll be happy to address uh, any questions after that. So just perhaps a quick uh, introduction. Uh, as Eric has mentioned, we are basically a market entry consulting firm headquartered in Singapore, but with offices in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And basically the type of services that we provide include everything from helping companies to find distributors to helping companies um, gather market research so that they can put their uh, market entry strategy together. Um, we, we also have a, a lead generation program to help companies that want to test the market before they uh, uh, fully go into the market as well. Um, what is unique about us is that we have a quite a bit of experience. We've been helping companies now for more than 20 years, and we've done thousands of projects in every sector imaginable. And so this experience has sort of given us a, a unique perspective because we see what good companies are doing when they internationalize and what not so experienced companies are doing uh, when they try to expand into the region. Um, this is just a section of our offices throughout the region and basically our team is divided into two groups. We have our market research and our trade teams who do the distributor search and the business uh, matching uh, projects. Uh, a lot of the uh, companies are uh, referred to us generally by government export agencies from North America, Europe and Asia uh, because of uh, our strong track record in helping companies. And uh, in that respect, um, I should also mention that um, uh, we are the in-market consultant in uh, five countries in Southeast Asia for um, Enterprise Singapore. Um, this will give you a sense of some of the sectors we've handled. So. Uh, we've helped companies selling everything from uh, apples to aerospace, dental equipment to defense equipment, education to environmental, medical to marine, and and uh, more. Uh, so this is just to give you a cross section of some of the uh, sectors we've been involved in. My presentation today is basically to sort of uh, make you think about some of these questions um, that are listed um, over here. And what my plan is that in my presentations, I will try to address uh, these various questions to give you a sense of whether this applies to you and whether there's room for you to also improve or also change your strategy. So let me just perhaps um, uh, dive straight into some of the case studies to give you a sense of uh, what I'm talking about. My first case study is basically about selling to the wrong sector. I know that sounds dramatic, uh, but let me exp perhaps give you some background as to what I mean. This was a client that was uh, manufacturing um, uh, insulated electrical cables and and because they were selling into the building and construction sector in Europe, they decided that in entering into the Thai market, um, uh, which is one of the markets they had identified, that they would also sell into the building and construction sector. And so in that respect, what they did was they identified a distributor in that segment. But after about two years, they were not really achieving any sales in the market. And so they felt it was time to look for a new distributor, which is why they came to us for assistance initially. But as part of the project, they also wanted to know more about the building construction sector. So what were the building standards uh, for their type of product? Who were the key decision makers? Who were the main developers, contractors? So that they could figure out the route to market in terms of decision makers, influencers, and so forth. So. So as part of the research, we had to find this information, speak to these companies and also to distributors so that we could sort of decide how they could approach the market once they had a new distributor. Um, so we started with the market research. And what did we find? 
there were no standards in the building and construction sector in Thailand that was similar to the standards back in Europe for their type of products, which was why their sales were quite poor. They just assumed the standards were there. Uh, but we found something else. And that was in Thailand, there was another industry that had strong standards for the type of products that they were selling. And that was in the oil and gas sector, as well as in the critical infrastructure sector. So when I say critical infrastructure, we're talking about power plants and, and so forth. So the client was very surprised by this because they never ever considered these two sectors to be their market they were just used to what they were doing in their home market and so based on our recommendation they changed their whole distributor search project and instead of looking for a new distributor in in the building and construction sector they decided to keep the existing distributor and look for a new one in the oil and gas sector and preferably if they could um, the critical infrastructure sector so here is my question uh, for this particular case study. Are you sure about the sector you're selling into? Or is it possible that there are other industry segments that your product could be selling into that you may not be aware of? Um, do you think that the sector you're selling to in your home market may be the same or may be different in Southeast Asia? And I think this is very something important to consider so that you don't start off on the wrong foot trying to pursue a market which may not be there, but perhaps in another segment there is there. Uh, and that was my purpose in sort of highlighting why um, identifying the right sector to sell into is always something to, to think about. All right. The next sec uh, case study is about the uh, your distribution network. And so this was a um, agri tech company that, that was selling throughout Southeast Asia, had also offices in all these countries, and and they approached us to help them find new distributors um, um, in Indonesia and in Vietnam. But when they initially made the inquiry with us, we did not understand the request. Why? Because in Indonesia, they already had more than 30 distributors. And in Vietnam, they had even more distributors. And so we were thinking, how many more distributors can you find? I mean, how many more can you add on? And so we spoke to them and they explained to us their current situation. And when we did some checking, we began to understand why they had asked us to find um, more uh, additional distributors for them. And it was primarily because all their distributors were pretty much connected to two or three main distributors. So we agreed and we went ahead with the project. And what was interesting was this. It was clear as we began the project that we could see that they had scope to grow further because uh, there were channels to their end customers, which I think they had thought about before that they had never, cons uh, they had not, uh, pursued for for lack of resources and 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 uh, time but uh, there was this ability to add on more uh, channel partners more resellers to the existing uh, net network but this was also what was interesting about this and i i mentioned this because many companies don't consider this as part of their uh, in market strategy in their case they said they did not need a company to import the product. The reason, they actually had their own company in the market that could be the eighth main importer. So really all they were looking for are the channels to the end customers while they took, they handled the importation. So this allowed them to work with multiple distributors of different sizes and to some extent also control the pricing. So, um, Maybe some of you are already doing this right now, but I thought I should mention this because with a lot of the companies that we deal with, they don't look at it this way. So I mentioned this case study because I think I found from my own experience that many companies tend to work maybe with one or more distributors because you know there are reasons of exclusivity or because the distributor is also the importer and all that. But if you could strategize and find a way to add more channels, 
you might find that there are maybe additional routes to market that you may not have considered as you as you as you look at a particular country so i just wanted to mention that in terms of your distribution network my next case study is about this question of market size all right and in this case we had a, a, a company that was uh, basically manufacturing a product that was sold into the electronics uh, sector. And so they approached us saying that they wanted to look for a, a, um, a, a channel partner in Indonesia, all right? And so when we were first approached on this, my question to them is why Indonesia? Because as far as I'm aware, you don't really have that many manufacturers of the type that they were looking for in Indonesia. And they said, look, we already have distributors in other markets like Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. You know, and we're pretty happy with the way things are going. And so to grow our sales, we were thinking of adding um, a new market to the mix. So I asked them, okay, if that's the case, how much are you selling into Malaysia now? And they gave me um, uh, uh, a sales number for 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 uh, their previous year and i was very surprised and i told them my sense is that number sounds quite small so i asked them so i suggested to them uh did do you know the mark so i asked them do you know the market size for your products in malaysia and they said they did not so what we did was we did a project to see if we could find market size info now, in this case, we were able to find such information because there was little local manufacturing of their products. And when we found the potential market size and shared it with them, they were very surprised. They realized how much bigger the Malaysian market was and they could see that, okay, maybe our current distributor was not perhaps doing a good enough job as we thought they were. So the project changed and instead of finding a new distributor in another country, it was to find additional uh, resellers in an existing market, in this case being Malaysia. So I, I come across this many times because companies spend more time opening up a new market without really uh, knowing if their existing market can be expanded further. And so the, the reason is this, because they don't have a sense of market size. So they're not sure if a distributor is performing or not, or not performing, all right? Now, admittedly, market size info is not easy to get, especially depending on the product, okay? And, or if you're in, your, in the service sector. Sometimes you can get some, inf uh, some information, sometimes you have to do make some inferences, but I think, information like this is always helpful as you decide on market selection and your and your market um, strategy All right. my next case study is what is your market strategy right um, so in this case um, i added this because i thought it would be good to highlight a certain point here and it's especially for companies in the services sector so this client was selling a service and their main customers were banks and they had many multinational bank customers that they were selling to directly in Singapore. So they decided that they wanted to approach the market in the same way in Indonesia by selling to the banks uh, directly over there. Uh, and they, were, they figured that since they had similar customers um, uh, uh, in Indonesia that um, uh, as they were selling to in Singapore that perhaps the 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 um, sales cycle will be uh, shorter so we told them initially like, our opinion is it's best to verify the uh, the route to market first before you approach these banks directly because a strategy in singapore does not mean uh, the same strategy works in indonesia but they decided to to um, to move forward and approach uh, the banks directly anyway so so we went ahead as they the uh, preferred and so we contacted uh, 20 banks. Uh, many of them were the same clients that they're working for in Singapore. And what happened? Only two banks were interested in meeting with them. And the client couldn't believe it. 
they were very surprised and um, and thought, well, okay, this is not right. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, one year later, when we happened to meet them, they 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 indicated they, they still had not had any traction in the market. And they sort of came to the realization that actually they should have perhaps looked at the, uh, the route to market first before deciding how to make the approach here. So why did this strategy of not going direct not work for them? Uh, I think there are two key reasons here. One is the business culture. And I think in Indonesia, and this is going to be the same in other countries as well, it really takes time to build relationships. And the second reason is this, if something is not broken, why change things? I mean, these banks already had a vendor providing the same services as the client. So as far as the bank is concerned, why do I need a change of vendor just because you are selling to the same customers or to my counterparts in another country? So I mentioned this case study because I think it's important to, to highlight this. We tend to work with a lot of companies who are always looking for ways to get into the market. But very few companies think about how to build the relationships with customers so that they can find a strategy to displace a current vendor. So I thought I, I should mention that as part of this thing. All right. This will be my last um, uh, sort of case study. Um, and in um, I thought it might be something to think about, uh, especially in, in our current environment. In this particular case, it was um, uh, for some of the challenges that uh, I've mentioned earlier. In this case, this company was having quite a lot of problems. You know, they were they were having problems finding a distributor in Vietnam. Yet, on the other hand, they also knew from experience in other countries that maybe distributors are not so proactive. Um, the client was uh, not ready to set up their own entity yet. So. So we pro decided, let's propose something else to you. Uh, and what we propose to them is, why don't you first figure out what is your uh, market entry strategy? Identify your end customers, identify your distributors, who are your competitors? Why is your solution better than others? Prepare you know, your uh, collateral and local language and so forth. And then, after that, let us do a lead generation uh, campaign for you where you know our in-country team can talk to potential customers and to channel partners and use this opportunity to sort of test the market see what your uh, your customers are saying maybe they don't want to buy the whole system maybe they maybe they only want to buy part of the system it's an opportunity to also see does your pricing work in the market and then if you do get an inquiry see if the company the customer is willing to to buy direct and if not ask one of the distributors that perhaps you've had a dialogue with earlier if they are willing to be the important so that you can use this as a way to kickstart the the relationship so why do I, we why did we propose this many a times we come across cases where companies have difficulty finding distributors or they complain that the distributors are not active or they don't know what is the problem. Is it a pricing issue? They, they just don't have any sense of the market. So what we were trying to suggest to them is that it, sometimes what you have to do is you, you've got to take a deeper dive in terms of understanding the market. And there, there are ways to doing this uh, before you really uh, go full into the mark, uh, market and try to figure out things. But at the same time, you're also doing a lead generation campaign so as to kickstart relationship either with uh, customers or with distributors, especially with channel partners um, as well. And why do I think uh, this is important? Look, I think um, this is a situation right now where because of the pandemic and all that, many, many think companies are thinking of onshoring manufacturing and all that, but at the same time, uh, there's also going to be a situation where there could be more competition for distributors. And the other thing is travel is also going to be, become difficult now. Who dares to travel? I mean, what if you, you know, um, for health reasons or for, or for other reasons? So it's time to start thinking of alternative business models and 
perhaps it's not just an onshoring of manufacturing, but sometimes you might need to think about whether it's time to onshore your sales and marketing functions as well, rather than just rely on channel partners or to do something independent of what your channel partners are doing. So that was the purpose of the way we structured this for, for them. And I think they were pretty happy with the way things were, uh, were going. So this is our last slide. Basically, these are the services that we offer, the market research, uh, the um, distributor search, and, and uh, our market immersion program for lead generation. Our incorporation services, we do all that with uh, Incorp, um, uh, our partner. So, uh, But basically, this is the core of our services. And, uh, and I hope that my case studies will give you a sense of some of the things you might want to think for in terms of your sales strategy for Southeast Asia. And with that, um, Eric, I will now pass it on uh, to you. Thank you very much for joining us again in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so uh, everybody, before I start uh, showing or presenting the slides, uh, again, just a re quick recap. If there are any questions uh, that you wish to, un to be answered or to be, to be discussed upon during the Q&A session later on, uh, post my presentation you can post it in the questions tab uh, on in this webinar too yeah so without further ado i'll be uh, starting uh, my uh, presentation as well so i think uh, Seraph has done a, a great job in in terms of presenting uh, what the different sales strategies that uh, companies uh, in asia on europe and in americas can adopt when they want to uh, try to look at uh, 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 penetrating this part of the world or, or going to expand to different parts of the world. So what I'm going to cover essentially will be in terms of uh, expanding regionally in Asia if you're already not in Asia or you're in one part of Asia but you're considering to uh, expand yourself to other countries within Asia. So it is as, as a way of a revenue diversification uh, strategy as I, I term it here. So a very quick two slider on a group snapshot uh, for Inco Group of companies. So we're one of the largest Asia-based uh, corporate services provider. We are present in a few countries as you can see uh, in the map below. We have about 450 employees uh, across Asia and our subsidiaries overseas. In terms of our full suite of service uh, in each of the countries that we are in, uh, this is a busy slide, but essentially you can see our overview of services uh, right from the start of uh, structuring advisory or how to incorporate your first entity uh, in each of the countries that we can uh, we can present. We also offer a, a series of uh, necessary and important services that covers accounting, that co covers taxation, immigration, business advisory, uh, etc., uh, which we aim to help uh, or to provide a one-stop offering uh, to all companies who want to, uh, to expand to uh, into this part of the world. So in terms of starting uh, my presentation, so uh, Sarah uh, earlier on covered the sales strategies. So in this portion, I'm going to cover strategies to combat the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, re uh, expanding regionally. So I, I think for all of you out here who are business owners or, or business partners or uh, companies uh, who are trying to uh, get rid or get out of this current situation uh, in, in terms of the pandemic. So essentially, you can take a look at um, two approaches. You can have the passive and short-term approach whereby you essentially adopt a wait and see. You plan for very short-term strategies for the next six months or so. You try to reduce your expenses to limit losses or to, to try to uh, improve your bottom line because top line is not growing. Or you try to take advantage of certain government support schemes that your country or uh, where your company is based in uh, offers. Or you can choose to be to take on a, a, a longer or longer term approach or a more active approach. You start planning for the next one to three year uh, strategies. You look at international markets as means of uh, expansion uh, and also as a mean of uh, revenue diversification away from the home country. You look at M&A opportunities, be it in terms of acquisition or be it in terms of fundraising to take advantage of this current slow market as you see it. You try to, again, take advantage of government schemes uh, that help you uh, expand overseas. So, for example, in Singapore, uh, the Singapore government gives certain grants uh, to help Singapore companies to expand overseas. Or you try to leverage on uh, digital or technology solutions uh, or even digital branding or digital marketing to try to uh, build on a longer term approach to, to brand building. 
So in terms of revenue diversification, all right, uh, as a way to combat the pandemic, I mean, over here, you can see in this quick slide, uh, it's a very simple illustration of how revenue diversification can improve your business in the long term and guard against unforeseen uh, economic or macro factors uh, in certain markets. So if you're a single market company now, that means you only have or your 100% of revenue right now is only in the home market. If a macro situation like the pandemic now or other future crisis, crisis that may happen uh, to your home market, if anything happens, right, your revenue will decline straight away and you will take a 100% hit. But if you start diversifying uh, your sales or your uh, uh, sales region, I would say, uh, to a few overseas markets in the next six months to one year or a few years down the road, and you try to spread out your revenue risk or that, uh, concentration as well. If any crisis happens, uh, such as a pandemic, for example, in specific countries or in a macro view, any hit that you take in one market, you're still able to recover from the other markets where you have reven uh, revenue sources as well. So which is why uh, in this segment that I'm going to covering, uh, I'll cover in terms of why you should look at uh, doing overseas market uh, uh, expansions. So in terms of key considerations to international expansion, and in this uh, series, I'm going to cover again uh, uh, six countries uh, in Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, India, Singapore, and Hong Kong, because this is where income group companies have presence in. And I'm going to essentially cover these nine uh, topics, I would say, in terms of le common legal structures, in terms of setting up time, what are the foreign ownership uh, restrictions in each of these countries, uh, the local resident director criteria, or if there is in each of the countries, what are some of the paid up capital requirements, uh, what are the special license uh, uh, that you will need in each country for particular businesses, uh, what is the uh, basic corporate tax regime, and what are the key things to look, to look at or to consider, uh, FX regulations or banking regulations in the country, uh, because this will essentially cover how easy it is for you to repatriate funds, dividends, uh, from your subsidiaries overseas back to your home country. And I'm going to discuss also uh, a little bit over one of the, some of the most common company structures that you can adopt to if you do decide to set up new subsidiaries or entities uh, away from your home country. So in terms of uh, legal structures, right, when you expand overseas, I mean, here you can see a very quick overview of some of the, the common business structures uh, in Asia, or not just ASEAN, but in Asia. Uh, in the different countries you're looking at. And you, as you can see, in each other country or within Asia as a whole region as a whole, uh, even though we are called Asia Pacific as a whole, you can also, I, I think all of you will have understand that in each of the countries, the regulations are very different uh, from one another, which is also in terms of the market entry into such markets, if you do decide to set up an entity in these markets, the legal structures that you will use or adopt will be very different as well especially if your company that is currently dialing in from Europe or from Americas, your company structures that you're used to in your home market will be very different uh, to consider if you do set up legal structures in these markets. And legal structures may vary, uh, or, or the, your advisors like us will uh, suggest different structures depending on what is your purpose of setting up. Is this uh, for the setting up purely in the purpose of uh, sales and marketing? Is it purely to establish local links, network, or do market research? Is it for a special purpose because you have specific investments in this country or you're going to do certain JVs with local partners? Is this entity built up for a local government tender of which uh, usually for local governments, they will want you to have a local entity before you can bid for any projects? Is this set up for non-profit charity purposes or purely for a back office? That means you are not going to have a, a business operation, but purely to set up a backend team to process your IT, or to do certain R&D works, or to just to simply have a service center means uh, for your local customers. Or, of course, you will go through the traditional route of uh, manufacturing. Uh, and also, you might want to uh, take a, or consider what are the some of the shareholdings between foreign and local if you do decide to go in through a JV. In terms of processing time for a new entity, this is uh, important for all business owners uh, to consider. Because again, if you're looking at, um, if you're considering in terms of 
you decide to enter Indonesia, you decide to enter um, in, uh, India or Philippines, how you're going to plan for your resource and the timing? When are you going to start talking to your local advisors uh, to enter the market? Because you'll be making an investment, you want to get a ground team running uh, ASAP. It's important to understand how long will you take for you to start the entity, to start your business, right? You will, it's important for you to understand in terms of World Bank ranking, how these uh, countries rank uh, in, the, in the world, uh, in terms of ease of starting a business, and in terms of overall uh, World Bank ranking, in terms of doing business as a whole. So in this table, you can see uh, for the six countries involved, uh, countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, is simple or easy to start a business. It takes between one to uh, within a week or so, or within a few days for you to start a legal entity. So in terms of that, uh, to get ground started, to start your earning your first revenue is pretty fast, and which also links to how in terms of World Bank ranking, Hong Kong and Singapore ranks very high uh, in the world. Um, in terms of other markets such as Indonesia, India, Philippines and Vietnam, uh, you can also realize that um, your, the, the timing to start a business or entity takes uh, much longer because local regulations is a lot more complex versus financial hubs like Singapore and Hong Kong. So, for example, a country like Indonesia will take you anywhere in between 30 to 50 days uh, to start a business and the process to start the entity uh, to get the necessary licenses is also much longer like Singapore and Hong Kong, which also translates to the ease, the ranking of uh, ease of starting a business is also way higher. So over here, you can see uh, one of the hardest country to start anything will be Philippines. It takes anywhere between one to three months uh, to start the legal entity. So the time to entry and setup will also determine how much time and resource uh, of your staff strength, of yourself time or your own time. Uh, to invest into uh, starting the business and when you're going to start your earning your first dollar. Um, in terms of expanding overseas, it's also important uh, for everybody to understand what the regulations to uh, foreign ownership or whether there is any foreign restrictions or foreign ownership restric restrictions in each of the countries. So if you look at this table uh, as a comparison table between all the countries, you can see that in countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, generally there are no foreign ownership restrictions. The entities that you set up can be 100% uh, foreign owned and there is no special uh, industry or negative list that uh, have a, a, a ratio between how much a local uh, shareholder needs to own versus a foreign company. So in other countries such as Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam and India, right? Uh, generally, yes, foreign ownership is allowed, but if your the, your intended business nature in the comp in the country will be or falls within the negative list or, or, or foreign investment negative list, you will need a local partner or you need to go through special structuring in each of the countries uh, before you can even start setting an entity and forming a business. So before deciding on the country, right? Before and and, and after understanding the market, after you engage say or research to do market research and a corporate advisor like us, it gives you all the options available for you to understand, is this a country where I can bring my business in into? And if I can, how much of the ownership can I own in these structures? And what are the structures uh, that I should adopt in each of the countries? Um, and, and in terms of some of the foreign investment approval from the local governments, right, for you to even start operating, do you need the license at point of incorporation? or do you need the license post incorporation? So in each of these countries, it's also very um, different. And you can also see that shareholder requirements is also different in each of the country, whereby different legal structures where you need minimum one shareholder. There are some countries like India, Philippines or Indonesia, you need minimum two shareholders in this case. And in terms of whether a, a corporate shareholder is allowed, yes, in all the countries, corporate shareholders are allowed. So what if your industry falls under the negative list? Right? Uh, whether is there a percentage where you need a local to own a uh, majority in the business, in the company, or you need a local to own, uh, to have a minority stake, or you definitely need to go in with the JV structure. So if, if there are such structures that, that uh, for you to understand, then it's, that's where uh, market research come in, uh, your prior research come in to whether you can get a local JV partner to go in uh, to, to start expanding or penetrating the market. 
So if all else fail, that means the business you're looking to enter or bring into the country falls under the negative, negative list of which um, the business nature requires 100% local ownership. That means a foreign ownership is not allowed. Then in that case, you might want to explore other options to start to build up uh, a, a local revenue source, whether by means of appointing local distributors or by means of using HR outsourcing or employee outsourcing solutions uh, with a corporate advisor like us, for example, uh, for you to hire somebody locally to at least do sales and marketing for you. In terms of local resident directors and company secretaries, right? Uh, I, I think for every country involved, there are certain uh, guidelines or criteria to which uh, you will need to have a local resident director at all times or to appoint a local resident uh, company secretary. So you can see that um, in all these countries here, besides Hong Kong, which allows a corporate director uh, to be named as a director in a company, all the other countries are not allowed, it's prohibited. And in most of the countries, you will need at least one local resident director. So if at the start of forming the company, you do not have anybody on the ground uh, yet, because you can't relocate one of your key staff over, you can't hire somebody quick enough because you need to form a company first. There's uh, other solutions such as maybe appointing uh, from your service provider, a local resident, normally known as executive director, to fit this criteria first before you start building up a team. So in terms of resident status, I say uh, for both of these countries, you need at least one local resident uh, director and uh, company secretary. So in terms of company secretary, it also varies uh, from country to country. You can see in uh, most of these countries, we call it a company secretary, of which you can outsource it to a, a, a corporate advisor or, salute, uh, or service provider. There are some countries where they don't call it a company secretary, they call it a commissioner or they call it a chief accountant, say in the likes of uh, Vietnam, or maybe in the likes of uh, China, for example, you, they call it a legal rep. So in this case, uh, uh, these are some of the very tools or requirements that each country uh, will bring you. And then uh, once you have set up the company, right, you can think about uh, whether you want to outsource totally uh, such services to service providers uh, locally, or you're going to start hiring a team uh, to, to satisfy these uh, local requirements. So in terms of paid out capital, I think this is important for any company. Uh, who are looking at forming new subsidiaries or entities in these markets because you want to ensure that you are aware of what is the minimum paid up capital that you will need to form a legal entity, how much investment cost you need to put in besides the, the, the advisor cost, the legal and uh, market research cost or the legal cost uh, that you need to incur to set up an entity. So in each of these uh, markets here, uh, I would like to point out to the minimum paid up capital uh, segment, uh, which is here. You can see that it also differs from country to country. For financial hubs like Singapore and Hong Kong, again, right, the minimum setup requirement is low. You just need $1 minimally um, to set up a company. But of course, depending on which uh, industry you're in, uh, you might want to set up a company with a higher uh, paid up capital structure. But again, to form a company at the start before infusing future capital, you just need $1 to start a company first. But of course, if you look at other markets such as uh, Philippines, for example, right? if you're going to engage to start a local subsidiary, uh, of which is majority uh, owned by a foreign company or to do a trading company or sales and marketing company, you will need to have a minimum paid up capital of at least uh, US dollar 200,000. If you look at Indonesia, right? Uh, if you want to have uh, a full foreign owned company, which in legal, local legal structure form, they call it the PTPMA. Uh, you will need to submit an investment plan of uh, 800,000 uh, for the start and then start infusing this 800,000 over a series of a few years uh, later on. So uh, these are some of the, the, the special rules that you will need to understand, right? Uh, before you can enter the market and, and decide, okay, this is a country I can go in. And in, in bulk of these markets, uh, most of the shares must be paid up uh, before uh, legal incorporation. Yeah? So understanding paid up capital, uh, paid up capital requirements uh, will help you understand and plan better plan for your cash flow uh, before you can, you can think about uh, engaging somebody to do it uh, for real. Yeah? Um, in terms of government licenses, I think this is important for all businesses uh, to consider because it can be a potential stumbling block 
uh, for you uh, if you want to penetrate the market. So over here, I have uh, shown a series of um, uh, uh, government news, right, uh, from various countries of which the government gives a roadblock or they do not approve a license uh, for companies who want to go in, right? In recent years, you can see Gojek's uh, license approval being uh, rejected uh, as a route hailing, a, a right hailing or cab service, right? When they want to enter Philippines, uh, you can see that in in Singapore's term, right? Um, the central bank has uh, uh, give special uh, license re regulations uh, recently for existing companies who are in the payment services space, or they have also give warnings to cryptocurrency exchanges that have been formed uh, in Singapore, or they have also uh, stopped issuing new licenses for e-scooting sharing services. So these are some of the examples that you should consider. Is your industry type something that's too unique for the country to accept? Is it something that you need to start engaging uh, with the local government first or start understanding whether this is something that will be approved, right? Before you start planning for resources uh, to enter the market. So this is uh, important for all of you uh, out here today uh, to consider. In terms of tax regime, I think this is again uh, interesting for all business owners uh, out here to understand what uh, taxes, uh, what is the basic corporate tax regime and corporate tax rate in each of these markets, whether there is VAT or GST or goods and services tax in uh, each of the markets, what is the dividend tax regime in each of these local markets once your subsidiary in these markets start earning uh, profits and, and you want to repatriate dividends back to your home country, what will be the taxation level? Is it easy to pay for corporate taxes in these countries, right? According to World Bank, as well as uh, the approximate time for it to comply uh, on an annual basis. So if you look at uh, all these markets here, obviously for, again, for Singapore, Hong Kong, we are one of the, uh, I would say, uh, competitively uh, uh, priced in terms of taxation, right? We are not the zero tax jurisdiction in the world, but among AAA countries, we are one of the lowest in the world. Uh, in terms of uh, copper tax uh, regime, of which if you look at uh, a bit uh, more difficult and complex markets such as uh, India, Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam, you can see copper tax rates being higher uh, in these uh, more complex countries. Uh, in terms of dividends tax, uh, I think for some of these markets, dividend, uh, when you declare, declare dividends um, from your local subsidiaries back to home markets, is uh, most of uh, these countries will adopt a zero tax regime in the local market. But in certain countries like Indonesia or Philippines, there is certain uh, withholding tax uh, involved in the local market, right? You, be, maybe, you may be taxed a certain percentage before you can even repatriate the profits uh, back to your home country. And in terms of uh, ease of paying or filing for corporate tax uh, in the market, whether you need to do it once a year or you need to do it quarterly uh, every, every three months or you need to do it every monthly, uh, some of these markets are difficult, right? Of which if you look at World Bank rankings in terms of ease of paying taxes, I think this gives you a sense of um, how easy it is um, for you uh, to pay taxes. So the higher the rank, obviously it'd be more difficult for you to file for taxes. So if you look at Vietnam alone, uh, it ranks 109 in the world uh, in terms of ease of paying taxes, which means it is difficult. And yeah, on average, you need about 380 hours a year to comply and pay for your taxes, of which more easier markets such as Singapore and Hong Kong will take a lot lesser time uh, to do this. So it's good to understand how long it is or how easy it is for you to comply uh, with local tax regime because the more complex it is, obviously you're going to incur higher expenses in terms of staff strength, in terms of outsourcing out to tax uh, agents uh, locally uh, to prepare for taxes for filing. And there are also other tax considerations in uh, uh, more difficult tax regimes of which, you know, you need to consider withholding taxes. Uh, you need to consider what are the custom duties, uh, what are the uh, DTAs that's been signed uh, between your home country and these countries. What is the transfer pricing policies uh, in such countries and your home country? And in terms of uh, tax residency uh, in all these countries uh, as well. So all these will play a part in uh, whether you're going to be successful in running your business uh, locally. Of course, when it comes to uh, going into a new market, understanding the banking regulations and FX regulations will be important for you because uh, to set up a, a business uh, overseas, you will want to ensure that any profits that your company there generates, 
you can easily replicate uh, back to your home country. So this table essentially shows uh, in between all the markets whether funds can be freely replicated uh, via dividends. Can it uh, be? Uh, will it? Will you need to essentially seek for government approval first before you can replicate such profits uh, as dividends um, back to your home country? Or in the future, if you're spinning off the entity, you're selling this particular subsidiary in Vietnam, for example, do you need a certain approval from the government first? So we can see again, uh, in financial hubs such as Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, there's generally no restrictions, right? Uh, in terms of repetition of funds and dividends. But again, if you go to the other more complex Southeast Asia or Asia markets, there are certain approvals from the local government needs to be obtained first before you can declare dividends or capital gains uh, back to your home country. So this is again important for you to understand because it will, it will help you understand in times of crisis or in times of needs, can you freely send money back from your profit making or cash flow generating companies overseas back to your home country. So this is again, like I say, uh, important for all business owners uh, out there. In terms of other considerations, there is non-tax driven, right? Uh, you can you have to understand again what is the group structure that is uh, that will propel your business forward in that country, be it local culture or be it local practices and uh, group culture. What is your positioning when you enter? I think Sarah earlier on has already covered this. What are your strategies when you go into this market? Is the market in this new market in these countries open or be able to be acceptable uh, to accept uh, your business solutions and uh, products they're going to bring in? What is the ease and flexibility to acquire, to divest uh, your, your, uh, your business or to acquire other businesses in these countries? Is there flexibility to explore investment opportunities locally? Is it as easy as Singapore, for example? Uh, is it easy to seek for investment opportunities or seek for funding opportunities from local investors, from local funds? Are you able uh, to ring fence your business risks, right? or your potential liabilities when you go into or enter into new markets, when you start signing for new business contracts, how is it easy it is legally in these countries for you to ring fence your risk. And also if in times where you do need to go to court, you need to go into a legal dispute, how easy or difficult or expensive it is for you to file for claims and, and seek demands uh, when you come to uh, that portion. So these are some of the, I would say the key uh, other non-tax considerations uh, that you should consider. And in terms of uh, most common company structure, right? Uh, I think these are some of the recommended structures. There's four options uh, here uh, where you can look at uh, if you want uh, forming or structuring before you enter into a new market. So uh, option one obviously will be the most typical route where your existing company that you have you simply set up a subsidiary in the country and you own 100% uh, of the entity as you enter the market. There are larger companies or international companies that want to structure, say you're from Europe or you're from uh, outside of Asia, you want to structure a Singapore or uh, uh, Asia HQ, right? A regional HQ, uh, either in financial hubs such as Singapore or Hong Kong. You might want to use your existing parent company uh, to set up a uh, a regional HQ, say in, in financial hubs like Singapore, Hong Kong, and using the Singapore or Hong Kong regional HQ to own all your subsidiaries in, in Asia. So in this case, you can leverage on friendly government banking regulations for future investments. You get a, a cheaper a source of funding or cost of funding from local banks or local funders because these are, I would say, uh, traditionally lower uh, interest rate environments. If you're going using Singapore, for example, you're leveraging on the, the huge amount of DTAs that Singapore have uh, with the rest of the world, which will help you in terms of taxation wise as you start sending money or a reputation of funds uh, towards your own uh, interrelated companies, uh, of which your parent company will still remain your foreign company uh, in this sense. And of course, for option three, there are some companies that uh, just want to straightforward set up a new company with no existing links or no corporate links to your existing company. Usually this is as a setup of a separate uh, invoicing sourcing arm, or it can be setting up as a, a, a family office of which you want to 
uh, operate the family's wealth in a triple A uh, country such as Singapore or Hong Kong again. And or you might be going into a different venture with different or local shareholders of which you do not want to have links with your existing company. And of course, the last option, uh, I think in recent years are a bit more popular of which uh, you're currently operating in the, in the, in the, I would say a more complex jurisdiction now. You want to use a, a, a branding in a triple A country or in a, in a politically and legally very stable country like Singapore or Hong Kong. Okay, maybe not Hong Kong in these days, uh, but you want to look at flipping the structure. You want to become a Singapore company instead. So you can maybe look to form a new holding company in Hong Kong to acquire your existing business and also start uh, forming subsidiaries under the Singapore uh, holding company. So again, uh, as a, a considerations to this will be in two proportions, uh, be it in terms of purpose, legally, structurally, uh, what you want to do, if there's a special purpose of flipping the holding company structure uh, to Singapore or Hong Kong or to a financial hub. Uh, or you have a taxation regime in, in purpose, or you're looking at future listing uh, in such uh, in these countries, or you have VC or private equity investors that is ready to invest into your company, but they prefer a tier one capital gains, a dividend tax, uh, uh, easy countries like Singapore to form the holding company structure so that they can invest directly into your Singapore holding company. So, so again, this, this option may not be for everybody, but uh, this is definitely one of the structures that you can consider uh, if there's a need uh, or the, a need for a rise. So with this, I've come um, to the end um, of the session and um, uh, we are, I'm opening out to the floor uh, for Q&A uh, uh, from the audience, right? You know, feel free to post your questions uh, in the pool. And uh, Sarah, if you can on your webcam, we can see your handsome, handsome face again. Uh, <laughs> Not so handsome, but can you see me now? Some of it. Uh, yes, uh, no, I don't. Okay, I've switched on my uh, notes. Okay. Okay, yes. So maybe we can start looking at some of the questions uh, from the floor. Uh, Okay, so maybe I think Eric, maybe we'll do a question. I think since it's almost, um, um, what do you think? We'll just do one question in the interest of time. Sure, sure. So, so maybe, uh, Sarah, uh, for you, uh, hmm. in terms of the, uh, in terms of, hold on, yeah, let me bring up my page. Sorry, there's a technical no worries, no worries. error. So in terms of the, uh, is there for a sales marketing strategy, right? In, in, in current mm -hmm. mode, how, because of the pandemic, how do you maintain mm -hmm. relationship with your clients uh, while everybody seems to be, ha or have to work from home? Well, I mean, I think um, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I think given, given the restrictions and the challenges of uh, staying in touch, companies have to think about their business model now um uh, one okay if they can't uh, are they building their relationships primarily to uh, channel partners but that means they're getting excluded from developing their own direct relationships and if that's the case do they need to perhaps consider as i say onshoring their sales and marketing and you know where um perhaps setting up an entity there even if it's one or two people just to, just to do that direct communication with clients. And maybe that might be something they have to think about, not necessarily in the long term, but just even now because of the travel restrictions and all that. And I think that's also something to think about now, especially as you know, markets like Europe and North America, where the domestic market has slowed down and more companies start to look out for opportunities here in Asia that the competition might become a little bit more um, um, uh, intense, and maybe this is a time where you know companies can think about okay, let's let's solidify our relationships, let's solidify our presence by having some local operation as well. So at least they can build that direct relationships with end customers rather than just um, channeling through uh, distributors. 
Thank you, Sarah. I, I think I got an interesting question from um, the sign up for the uh, from the registration. So mm -hmm. I think this may be a, a this question may be very wide, but there's an audience that asks in terms of in the opinion of the speakers, uh, which country will be the best to to penetrate or to incorporate post COVID. So I think this is a, a very interesting question, but maybe very quickly, mm -hmm. Sarah, um, before I, I add on, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the six markets that we have spoken about today, maybe mm -hmm. we can talk about uh, for each market, what will be, uh, what are some of the key benefits for certain business segments they to want to mm -hmm. consider uh, between these six countries? Well, I mean, uh, uh, clearly it depends on the uh, the product or the service that they are looking at. But of course, without question, the flavor of the season right now is Vietnam, right? I mean, I think the fact is that there's so much going on in Vietnam right now in terms of man, uh, FDI going in, the interest in the market, how they've uh, come out of this whole COVID environment. So I think Vietnam, depending on the fit, could be one market to look at. Um, I think um, uh, outside of that, it's a question of what other countries are going to do to perhaps loosen up their 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 business environment. I know from our perspective, we are still getting a lot of inquiries for Philippines, even Thailand, even uh, Malaysia, for that instance, because of how industrialized these countries are as well. But what's your Thank thought, you. Eric? No, I, I agree with you. I, I guess to everybody out here, in ter in terms of uh, rather than asking us the question on whether which country is the best place to go, uh, mm -hmm. we need to yes, we need to understand what is your business trying to promote, what is your mm -hmm. business trying to sell. I mm -hmm. don't think there's a market that is a no no for any business, mm -hmm. right? But once you have a correct uh, entry point, with a correct strategy to go into the market, I think all these countries uh, will suit most businesses. Obviously, mm. as a financial hub like like Singapore, right? I mean, I won't talk about too much about Hong Kong, uh, but mm. again, Hong Kong traditionally is very strong as a financial hub uh, for companies to set up regional HQs or teams uh, in Hong Kong or as a gateway into China. But increasingly, because of current situation now, maybe yes, uh, Singapore has a stronger story uh, mm. as a triple A country uh, to set up a regional yeah. headquarters to not just penetrate the local market, but using it as a springboard to go into. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Asia as a whole. And of course, mm -hmm. for manufacturers out there, uh, countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines are very strong uh, in terms of managing setup because cost of funding, you know, cost of operating there and work manpower cost is low. So again, uh, the business nature uh, will be important um, for this. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a question. Uh, maybe I'll take uh, maybe two more questions, uh, Sarah. I think that's uh, fine. We can always over sit a little bit. Sure, so sure. how yes. important is uh, localization in the content of new market entry strategy? Uh, I think localization is important, but I think the question becomes um, wh what is the definition of localization? I, I think um, Typically, when companies think about localization, they think about okay, um, do we do we uh, manufacture something um, uh, uh, in the market for price reasons and and all of that? But I think uh, I would say that sometimes, and this is where being able to build that relationships or uh, being able to speak to end customers directly is very important because localization can also mean. Um, um, adaptation of the product uh, and all that in in, uh, in different ways. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, yeah. One is uh, we, we had a project where a company was trying to sell a turnkey uh, wastewater treatment system. This is what they were doing in North America. And they came to market with the assumption that, okay, you know, given the number of islands in Southeast Asia, remote communities, let's sell a remote uh, turnkey water treatment system. But the reality is, as they got to speak to various customers, they, they came away realizing that, look, there's no interest in my whole system, but there's only interest in one particular component of my whole treatment system. And that is my membrane. They, they had built their own proprietary membrane. So in that respect, it was localization from the standpoint that understanding the market and realizing okay let me i don't need to I, I can't sell my whole system but there's clear market demand for for one component and that was 
eventually the product that they um, uh, were selling to in uh, Southeast Asia. And that was localization based on market knowledge. And the other example I, I always like to quote was uh, more than uh, tw uh, something I learned more than 20 years ago when, again, it was a client who, who was selling a, a very uh, complex system, full process controls and, and all of that and the customer um, this was in Indonesia saying, okay, nodding his head. And eventually the, the customer said, look, I'm not interested in uh, all these bells and whistles and I'm not interested in uh, a fully automated system. And uh, the, the manufacturer was surprised and said, why? Look, this is Indonesia. I can hire 10 people to stand there to press the start and stop button. I don't need automation. And so again, that's mm. a, that's another example of okay, what is the local market requirements are used and and so it's either local manufacturing or building something specific for the local needs without all the bells and whistles. Those are two examples. I think. Thank you, Sarah. I, I guess to add on to your point, uh, in terms of localization as a corporate advisor, I think of um, understanding local culture, right? Uh, so when mm. you set up a business, the market is right for your products and services. Um, understanding how people in those countries work and do business is also important to, uh, to all of you because mm. um, in terms of the, um, uh, you, you need to have a sense of how the local market works, uh, how people or your employees will work uh, locally before you can even um, consider uh, 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 make uh, your business a success. Yeah? So in, in markets such as Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, or in Southeast Asia, this is something that's, that's uh, uh, important, right? So having a local mm. team uh, will be yep. helpful, very helpful um, for you mm. to see uh, if you understand the local culture, you can get things moving or not. Mm. So, I, I think, so I think we will take the last um, question, right? Uh, so again, I, I think since we are in the pandemic here, I, I see a few questions um, in terms of um, what would be the impact on the political situation or government uh, factors uh, due to the current pandemic situation. Maybe we're ending off with this uh, last question. So any any thoughts on this, uh, Sarah? Oh, on the politics. Uh, <laughs> I, <suppose. laughs> I, I well, think I not suppose. so much on the, we can answer it not, maybe not so much on the politics, but I guess yeah. uh, we can think about, uh, about it in terms of um, uh, whether it's the pandemic situation or not. Uh, from my point of view is business is still ongoing. If yep. you have to, after doing your local research, right, lockdowns will definitely be ease uh, in the days to come. So business will start flowing again. So I, I think there's never a good time uh, for you to start exploring all these markets. All mm -hmm. the governments hopefully is keen to restart the economy or the various economies again. So I think there's a lot of opportunities um, out there. Absolutely, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. So thank you everybody for joining in. So I just want to have a quick request again. Thanks, if you have any specific questions, I mean, there's many questions that we see here. Uh, but if you don't have the time to answer all your questions, uh, please write in to myself and Sarah uh, after this email, as you can see our email addresses here, uh, and we will uh, love to speak with you off the line. And uh, also, uh, I want to, uh, to highlight again, uh, we are running a series of uh, webinars uh, from tomorrow onwards. So uh, we will go by a country specific uh, webinar. So tomorrow we'll be focusing on India. On Thursday, on the June 4th, we'll be fo focusing on Philippines. On June 5th, we'll be focusing on uh, Indonesia. On June 9th, we are focusing on Hong Kong. And on June 10th, we are focusing on Vietnam. And June 11th, we're focusing on Singapore. So you know, feel free to join in again uh, with us. And after this session, we will also follow up with an email to you on the video recording. Um, of this session, as well again of our email contacts, uh, of which you can please feel free to reach out to us and we can continue the discussions or your to answer your questions um, from then on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Thank you, Eric. I hope to see all of you to attend all our webinars in the days to come. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.